You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts Uncle Mike Tussaud from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionFit.com, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionFit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody, that rockin' tune means it's time to kick off the week the right way. Yes, it's time for the Option Block. My name is Mark Longo from the OptionsInsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting Options Insider Radio Network. Seems like the markets are raring to go to kick off the week here. <laughs> Going to get to that in a second. Of course, you guys can join us live every Monday and Thursday, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern, after the fact. Whenever your heart desires, via whatever platform you like. Just make sure, however you listen to us, make sure you hit us up those questions, those comments. If you enjoy what you hear, make sure you leave a review in your platform of choice as well. These times, more than ever, it's important to continue helping new folks discover the network. A lot of you are doing so as we speak. We welcome all the newcomers, of course, all the time. Huge influx these days, as you might imagine, but it always helps that people out there looking for a source of quality content in these troubled times leave a review Help them find their way to it. And joining me on the old program today, first off, via that 20th century magical technology known as telephone, <laughs> we are joined once again by Uncle Mike Tussaud from St. Charles Wealth Management. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the program, sir. Always happy to be here. Especially on an Uncle Mike kind of day today in the markets. It is a little Uncle Mikey. That that is that is certainly the case. And also joining us, we don't know where the heck he's joining us from. Could be the uh, Option Pit slash Carmen Line World HQ. Could be a Costco near you. It could be uh, scenic and super sunny Texas. We don't know. He is the greasy as meatballs, Mr. Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com by way of Carmen Line Capital. Mr. Meatball, welcome back to the program. And are you a Texan yet? No, I'm not. I'm still in one of the 10 towns that changed America. Beautiful, scenic, lovely Riverside, Illinois. Uh, you know, we'd, lo- we'd love to see it come out here. It's a wonderful place, delightful place to live. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, uh, we're still social distancing and, and, uh, and quarantining, self-quarantining. So I am coming to you from my, uh, my home office, which... <clears throat> happens to double as my spare bedroom. So, <laughs> yeah, you know uh, these are good times. And if you like said town of Riverside, Illinois, perhaps you want to move there in the near future. Hit up, hit up the meatball. He might have, he might know a thing or two. Might know a place for you out there. As we keep on rolling right on into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for the trading block. All right, everybody, welcome to the trading block, the portion of the show where we break down what the heck is trading. And man, there's a whole heck of a lot of green on the screen. Kind of find ourselves in a weird moment here in the markets coming into this week because, of course, 
everyone from the Surgeon General to the administration warning that, hey, we're in store for some pretty grim times ahead. Surgeon General equating this to Pearl Harbor and all sorts of other pretty catastrophic yet also inciting events and moments in the history of our nation. So prepping for some grim numbers coming out of the fight against the coronavirus, but also hinting out of the administration and others that perhaps there is a light at the end of the tunnel if we can suffer through these next couple of weeks. Then perhaps uh, there is a ray of hope, a glimmer of hope on the future. Uh, the market certainly feeling that as well. We got uh, the S, the NASDAQ, the Dow all up north of 5%, about 5.5% right now, which is just feeling the love. Who else is feeling the love out there as well? Of course, our old friend Mr. Ackman, who made headlines a few months ago talking about people talked about he was just bearish. No, he was just hedging his portfolio. That seemed to be a pretty well timed hedge, though. It worked out pretty well for him. And he, of course, has been talking down this market quite a bit. Clearly, he's decided to get long. Because he's talking the hell out of the market right now, uh, saying he's beginning to get optimistic. Cases appear to be peaking in New York. Of course, he's not an epidemiologist. I'm not sure why why people would look to him for that. But either way, he's talking up the market uh, pretty hard right now. So the market seemingly liking what he's saying because the market's feeling optimistic right now. And, of course, our old friend Vix Cash uh, taking a bit of a break right now, down about 44.3. That puts it down, oh, nearly eight handles. From where it was this time last Thursday, our old friend VVIX, a.k.a. the Vol of Vol, still hot, still heavy, still frothy, but also shy of that 150 handle, down about five handles to about 146 right now. Still extremely volatile volatility, but way off the peaks of late, which is not surprising. The realized Vol in the S has come in, so when that happens, volatility and indeed VVIX is going to come in a little bit as well. BXX, of course, also... Our old friend that continues to like to erode, feeling the love to the downside, which is how our listeners like it these days, down about 5.3 or so handles, down to about 42 and a half or so. Let's go back around the horn. Since it is an Uncle Mike type of day, let's start with him. Mr. Uncle Mike, via that magic technology known as telephone, what is lighting up your tape in this most Uncle Mike of days, sir? Well, everything is awesome. I mean, I figure if we have 10 more days like this, we're back to all-time highs. That's the way I look at it. Um, but, uh, I think that there, there's two things with this market right now. The first one is that, yeah, yes, it does look like we're going to have, uh, more death this week, as the president said yesterday. Uh, that's what everyone's saying right now. And so the, the one thought is that maybe the market knows that it's going to happen. Uh, but I think that also, uh, the market was just kind of starved for good news in some way, shape or form. And when, uh, Governor Cuomo, uh, the most gr- a very grim and doom like person in a very bad situation. I mean, not I'm not trying to say him politically, but just from the situation that he's in right now, he has to be very cautious and very doom and gloomy from where he's at. But <clears throat> when someone like that in that situation at the pretty much the epicenter of the the virus itself is saying something that might kind of sort of be good news, the market rallies 5%, so or continues its rally that it was already in. So I think that w- with those two things, that's kind of explaining today's rally with where we're at, uh, what we're doing, uh, that type of thing. Uh, the other thing, lighting up my tape, just looking at corporate bonds just as a kind of a, a gauge, LQD is up 1.5% on the day. Uh, I believe the reason it's, it's up is just because of the fact that uh, there is uh, – uh, just uh, faith that a lot of these uh, triple D and above rated uh, bonds are going to be okay. Uh, but on the flip side, there's a rush out of safety in that uh, if you look at the government treasuries, the value of them uh, is down a little bit today. And I'm speaking of, of course, of IEF as well as uh, TLT. So we have those things that are happening. Uh, Vix, I'll save that for Mark to, to go through today, but uh we have that along with uh, money coming into uh, the precious metals again. Silver's up to uh, just under 2.5% on the day. Uh, gold is up uh, just under 2% on the day. So we have a lot of money that's coming back. And I think just where it's coming back from is that uh, when things were being sold into this, uh, money was going into money markets. Now, I wouldn't necessarily say that this is the this is the rally, this is the sign, everything is good now, this is the all clear, let's buy. No, I'm not going to say that quite yet. But uh, I do think that uh, 
today's close is pretty key because the highest that we've been in since we've started this um, downturn, we had a rally up to 270 uh, roughly two weeks ago on Friday, uh, the day that Trump declared the national disaster. And it was, we had a 200 point rally in the S and P that day or shortly after that conference. So what Trump did is he took a chart of the Dow on the day and he autographed it and was sending it to democratic Congress people. And so naturally the market tanked the following week. But, um, I think that today's close is pretty important to see if we can test that number, if we can get, get up there. Now, Grant, I know I do realize that's another 80 S and P points away approximately, uh, but it is uh, doable. And in a in day like today, um, also, I think uh, this is we're also at a key number. If we can stay above the 260 mark, uh, we haven't been able to get through it in the, over the course of the last week and a half. So I think today is a pretty important closing day, especially that it's on a Monday. Uh, and also the fact that we have a shortened week this week. There is no trading on Friday this week for the Good Friday holiday. And so uh, there's going to be a lot more, vol- in theory, there should be a lot more volatility this week just because of the fact that um, there's less time to trade it. So a lot going on, uh, as we all know, and uh, excited to hear the meatballs take on the VIX. And we all know your rules when the market's down. You can't really uh, get back in whole hog yet. But have these, well, not recent because we sold off just a session before this, but has today's rally and perhaps some of these the news from the weekend, has that made you perhaps start testing the waters, or nibbling a little bit more? Or are you still waiting for a few more points on the upside, Uncle Mike? Well, in, in the buy and hold section of the portfolio or just where I have extra cash available, I, I've been nibbling for like the last few weeks for sure. Um, I think that uh, this is a market for me that if you want to buy something and hold it, then now is a phenomenal time. I mean, I had, I had a, a new client a couple of weeks ago when the market was just starting to come down saying, Oh, we were all excited, but then all this news came out, and uh, now we're not quite as excited anymore. And my response was, well, you're getting in at way better prices now than you would have a couple weeks ago, and that money was in cash, so you should even be more excited now than you were a couple weeks ago. So that's kind of my opinion on this, and uh, I think that if you if you can hold for the long term and you want to buy a high-quality stock or uh, buy the SPY or a, an index fund in and of itself, then I think now is a great time for it. There you go. From the Uncle Mikeist of uh, guys to you, perhaps an interesting time. I know, judging from your uh, poll responses and your feedback, you, a few of you are nibbling, others are fading. So uh, we'll see how that changes, perhaps, as these swings continue. Mr. Meatball, same question for you, sir. What is lighting up your tape in this somewhat strange yet extremely green and bullish start to the week, sir? Yeah, you know, um, it, it's hard not to look at this market and say and, and see some green shoots. Uh, I am... Uh, you know, I personally agree with Mike. I think that if you have a one-year time frame or longer, um, it, it's hard not to want to put some money to work. Uh, and, and if you're unwilling to do that, you should ask yourself whether you should be in stocks at all because you may just not have the stomach. Uh, because what I find that's really why retail – people wonder why retail traders lose and why – money managers lose the most common mistake that I see out of bad money managers and retail traders is they want to buy when the market is going up and they don't want to buy when the market is tanking and your, your attitude needs to be a little bit more the opposite, right? I view these prices that we're getting, especially in, you know, some of the, the bellwether names, uh, and we've talked about a few of them as, you know, levels that we're not, we're not going to see once we get out of this for a while, uh, unless we really, really, really have a, a, a worldwide depression. Uh, it's, it, it, it's a real good opportunity to get in there and, uh, and, and go long some names if you don't need the money for a year or two. And what's been lighting up things in your pitch chat and your vol trading club these days, sir? You know, there are a lot. Um, we're looking at the banks. Um, I am starting to look through the, the, the pile of ash that is the retail stocks to see 
what's going to last and what isn't. Um, in my, uh, I'm going to be putting out a retail trade in for my Sharp Bet service tomorrow. That is uh, pretty darn nice. I will give you a hint and say that this co- half of this company's value is in cash, and uh, it, which is crazy that it is that cheap. Um, and so I, I do see a lot of value in retail. Uh, one name that uh, you know Mike and I have talked about repeatedly uh, on this show is Coca Cola, which continues to I think be a value, uh, and. You know, I think that um, you have to ask yourself, what do the oil names look like? An interesting, an interesting question, and maybe this is a Mike Tussaud question, is if all these shale companies go out of business uh, and Exxon and Chevron are there to scoop them up uh, in, out, in and out of bankruptcy, uh, wh- what value does that place on those companies? And um, you know, are, have they got maybe gotten, are we maybe under positioning there and, and under pricing some of their ability to really benefit from the 40% of chapter 11s that's going to take place in shale oil. So that, that's another area I am looking at. Yeah, there certainly have been at least a few chapter 11s so far. And if we stay at these levels, probably, more than a few more out there. Interesting stuff. You're, you are becoming a little baby Buffett out there. You're doing the long-term puts. You're talking up Coca-Cola. <laughs> Next thing you know, you've been moving to Omaha. Baby Buffett Sebastian out there. I like it. Let's see what the market likes out there on a day like today. Again, we have been rocking and rolling for some time. Not quite this hard to the upside for a while. So maybe that's triggering some paper. And that seems to be the case coming into showtime. We're seeing... Decent numbers, not exactly blowing the doors off uh, compared to the ADVs, even which have come in a little bit over, over the course of the last week as well. But again, that goes back to the notion that today, notwithstanding, we are recently our realized vol has not exactly been living up to what we've seen those crazy limit down days of a few weeks ago. So perhaps not surprising we're seeing, or not seeing, I should say, an explosion of paper on the tape. A VIX at about 283,000 contracts as of a few minutes ago. Uh, that puts it about a quarter of its ADV, uh, ADV a little bit north of a million contracts, about 1.06 million. Uh, the SPY, a little more than half of actually of its ADV. Now the ADV is still robust. It's about 6.5 million out there. They're hitting about 3.6, 3.6 one or so million contracts as of a few minutes ago. So SPY is still continuing to do some impressive paper out there. The S at about 860,000 contracts. The ADV, about 1.9 million or close to it, which is a little bit light if you know the S, but still impressive given the fact that that's all completely electronic right now and people have been lamenting wide spreads and not exactly a lot of size on those bids and offers yet still doing a pretty impressive amount of paper out there the queues at about 440,000 a few minutes ago the ADV is 843,000 out there and IWM at about 415 and the ADV is about 654 so the small caps doing a lot of paper out there today which is have you if you've been following the small caps if you've been listening to shows like Twifo where we go deep into small caps a lot over there. You've been, you've been realizing that small caps have been leading this charge to the upside and to the downside of late, kind of blowing away the notion that small caps are this somewhat insulated, somewhat isolated little silo that kind of move to the beat of their own drum and they can ignore the macro currents out there. They're more volatile for a reason, and they've been displaying that aggressively of late. And it seems like today, from a volume perspective, IWM lighting it up. Let's see how much it costs us to break into the top 10 and what is out there in the top 10 today. It costs you 162,000 contracts to break into the top 10 right now. So that's actually a fair amount of paper out there. So single names looking pretty active out there. That starts at number 10. Some newcomers out there to the top 10 too, which is kind of interesting. Number 10, Delta Airlines at 162,000 for that number 10 spot. Number nine, it's compatriot slash rival out there, American Airlines at 165,000 out there. A lot of aviation names in the bottom half of our top 10 because number eight right behind it are our friends across the street here boeing 166,000 contracts number seven a rear appearance in the bottom half of the top 10 for tesla a mere a meager a paltry 219,000 contracts for them then we get on to number five this is a carnival carnival the cruise lines of course at 200 and 22,000 contracts. Number five, Bank of America, 226. So we're only in the top half of the top other, just getting into the top half of the top 10 here. And we're already over 200,000 contracts. So that's a pretty active day. Number four, Microsoft 
has been pretty active of late. A lot of folks Skyping out there, perhaps using Office as well, playing the Xbox as well. So maybe a bit of a trifecta for Microsoft. Either way, it's been in our top 10 pretty much every day for the last couple of weeks, and it's in the top half of the top 10 today. 265,000 contracts on the tape. Number three, AMD, another perennial top tenner out there. 285,000 contracts, folks. I guess loading up on their graphics cards and loading up on their processors out there. Either way, AMD, still still up there. Number two, good old Lukin Coffee. A pretty active day for them. 328,000 contracts. That means number one is, yep, you guessed it, the old fruit company, 436,000 contracts on the tape as of a few minutes ago. Let's see. Let's look really quickly and see if we can see where the most biased paper appears to be. Looks like it's Lukin or is it Luckin? Either one of those here. For 73% of that paper coming on the call side of the ledger. So folks liking themselves some upside out there in uh, Lukin. Number two is Carnival, 67% out there. Interesting stuff worth noting. We do have not really a lot (laughs) on the earnings docket for this week. Everyone's waiting for the cycle to kind of kick off in earnings. In in earnings. In earnest. In earnings. (laughs) Coming up in a couple of weeks there. And then we'll start really seeing... The rubber meet the road for exactly how much this coronavirus is impacting a lot of names out there. I think a lot of people are expecting a pretty dire cycle. So perhaps that means things will be interesting. Perhaps that means things will be quiet. Last cycle kind of underperformed from an overall expectations versus actual movement perspective. Maybe we'll see a little bit of a flipping of that script this time around. I mean, we also know a lot of CEOs are going to be pointing their fingers at coronavirus for some bad numbers, regardless of whether or not it actually makes sense. That's kind of the old deal. Earning season, often excuse season out there. We'll see what excuses they come up with right now. Meanwhile, it's time for us to come up with some interesting names for you guys. It is time for the Odd Block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by theoptionsinsider.com. It's time for the Odd Block. Everybody, welcome to the Odd Block, the portion of the show where we break down some weird, some wild, some just sometimes head scratching paper that is lighting up our tapes out here. We unleashed our Eye of Sauron. Even though there's a lot of paper going up out there, it hasn't been a ton of crazy prints for our Eye of Sauron to really sink its teeth into, but we did find a few that are interesting. Starting off with a name that we haven't really, I don't believe, talked about on the show before. If you have indeed, it's been quite some time. This is Wayfair Inc. Ticker symbol W, this is an American e-commerce company. Of course, they sell uh, some furniture and indeed some home goods out there. Trading right now, (laughs) $70.34. Up $19.88, nearly 40%. 39.5% rally out there. Good griefus. Apparently, folks are buying uh, office furniture and home furniture. Out there right now, because Wayfair is just blowing the doors off, I think is the technical term out there. I'm guessing they may have earnings today. I I don't see. I'll have to look at our earnings report to see. Either way, folks liking themselves some Wayfair. It's not enough to maybe rival where it was a year ago. A year ago, the stock was trading pretty much double what it is right now. It was nearly 150. Actually, the 52-week high came came a few weeks later at 166.5, so more than double where it is right now. Then it kind of got into, it looks like this long, lingering malaise for the better part of the last year. They kind of just trended downward, trended downward. At about January of this year, they were trading right around 110 or so, so they had already come off quite a bit, about 50 handles. And then, of course, since January, we all know what happened to the market and what happened to this name as well. It got cut pretty aggressively. In fact, wow, they're they're actually well off their lows. This thing got annihilated. It sold off from 100, a little north of 100, about 110 in mid to late January, all the way down to its 52-week low of 2170 back just a few weeks ago. So this thing got annihilated, and now apparently it's on the rebirth trajectory because it is up pretty much 3x more than that since then. It's trading $70 even right now. It was trading 2170 A few weeks ago. So, wow. Online furniture. Who knew? This is where the action is these days. And this thing is just moving 
rock 'em, sock 'em robots out there again today. Let's see what our Eye of Sauron found. You might think with a day like today, it would be all calls all the time, but that would be too easy for our Eye of Sauron. It likes to dig a little deeper. And today it found something on the put side of the spectrum. In particular, we've got some pretty near term April, uh, April puts going out so in just a couple weeks. April 50 puts. So these are now, given today's move, these were at the money a session ago. Now they are $20 out of the money puts. Someone got these off for a buck 50. That's an impressive level, given uh, what we're seeing out there. A buck 50 on the bid. These things were a buck 50 at 210. This guy wasn't playing around. He's like, a bid for 850 puts sold to the tune of 6,424. Uh, these are. Interesting, and are indeed impressive, impressive out here from a, a vol perspective. What is this? This is 175, almost 176% vol on these bad boys, listeners, in case you were curious. There are earnings. Actually, earnings are actually not today. Earnings are on the 1st of May, yet apparently they just uh, pre-announced some good numbers here because the market liking what they're seeing out here. So someone deciding, given all of this recent data, that they're okay blasting away at this 50 strike because... This thing is now well in the rearview mirror. Of course, there is some risk to this, obviously. They got a buck and a half, but this thing was almost 30 handles shy of that a couple of weeks ago. So these puts could indeed be aggressively in their face in the not-so-distant future. Uh, Interesting stuff. Mr. Meatball, let's kick things off here. What was a pretty aggressive, now kind of 20 handles out of the money, line in the sand puts here. What's your, what are your thoughts here? And also just the incredible volatility we're seeing in Wayfair, sir. Is this one that's come across your radar out there in your crazy pit chat of late, sir? I mean, it's not usually one that lands on our, our thing. But, yeah, this is one of those where, um, you know, it, people hear a lot of the commercials. They see that. Um, and, and it tends to fly around. Now, they're basically a mail-away glasses company, um, and, you know, it's, it's interesting to see all that, all the, the movement this thing has had. It is not, you're, you're right, it is not a, a slow mover. Their last earnings were abysmal, and the one before that wasn't very good either. So um, you got to wonder whether they're going in and saying, hey, maybe the bottom is in. Uh, earnings are in a few weeks, so... Uh, this could be a uh, a bit of uh, let's uh, let's see what we can get out of out of that that earnings value here and 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 trade around it. Yeah, the company I guess reporting that their business has more than doubled towards the end of March. Even though their entire staff is working from home, they said their logistics facilities are fully operational, and like apparently that's uh, that's contributing to a lot of apparently people needed a nice office chair to work in their home office. Who knew? But apparently Wayfair, feeling the love out there. This is a crazy one. This is not one I expected to be. That's why the Eye of Sauron is fun sometimes to unleash in times like this uh, because there's some interesting stuff. Speaking of interesting stuff, let's go back really quickly. Mr. Meepo, I'm going to ask you to put on your way back pants. Let's go all the way back now to the heady days of January 24th. Or excuse me, January, February 24th. When the coronavirus seemed like just a mere blip on the radar, we were selling off, but not quite into the depths of the madness we have sunk to uh, right now. Because back on February 24th, we were talking about B&G Foods, ticker symbol BGS. Uh, This is the name. I won't give you worse trading right now, listeners, because that's a bit of a spoiler. But at the time, the stock closed on February 24th. $13.09. $13.09. This is one we joked about at the time because they were founded to sell pickles and relish and condiments in 1889. They since have expanded to other packaged and branded foods since then. But pickles got the whole ball rolling out there, listeners. So we joked about some line in the sand puts for pickles because that's what we were talking about back then. They were talking about the March 12 half puts. At the time, they were fairly close to at the money. Someone coming in and it seemed like they were a little bit spooked to the downside. Because they were lifting that offer. They were $0.60 cents at 70 Someone lifting that offer about 5,800 times. A total of nearly 7000 went up on the day. Now, the caveat being there that that print was late. So a little bit hard to sometimes intuit the late prints as much. But on the surface, it seemed like someone was a little bit spooked to the downside, was willing to shell out a little bit of cash to hedge their exposure there in B&G Foods. And you might think that was a decent play because most of the market sold off. But packaged foods... Clearly, there's been a bit of a 
bit of demand for those of late because outside of a little bit of a blip out there right on one day here on the 11th, outside of that, or I'll shoot me on the 12th looks like, outside of that little blip, the stock has pretty much never looked back since this trade went up. Uh, the stock was at 1309, like you said, on that day. It's kind of pretty much trended up every day since with a little bit of a blip down to 1163 on March 12th. So that is within the lifespan of these puts. So he had a brief moment where these puts were worth uh, worth a little bit of cash, worth or a little probably about a buck at that time, a little bit more than that. So he could have taken them off at that little bit of a blip. Unfortunately, our friend did not. He held these bad boys all the way through to expiration because about 8,000 of these were still open on expiration in March. And the stock closed, unfortunately for him, or perhaps fortunately, we'll see, uh, at 1761. Uh, So those puts, again, if we read the tea leaves as they seem, it seems like someone was hedging. Again, that print was late, so he could have been getting a good print and good fill at selling these bad boys a line in the sand, in which case he's probably happy this stock turned around. Either way, if he bought these things on a hedge, he wasted not quite half a million, about 409000 If that total of 7000 was his, he wasted about half a million dollars on it. Of course, he probably owned some stock, in which case he's up about four handles, so he's probably doing all right net on this trade. Uh, but still, from a purely options perspective, it seems like he threw away about half a million bucks. Mr. Meatball... Are you down with that interpretation, or are you feeling maybe this guy had a little bit more judicious use, and he was right in that premium, and he's laughing all the way to the bank, sir? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know exactly. I mean, there's a reason. I don't understand why you don't you don't close this type of stuff, but, uh, you know, the, it may be tied to some sort of structured product or something like that, and this whole thing is going to go away. The, the the fact is we just don't know. Um and uh, and or you know who knows what uh, what what he's going for? But yeah, if if this was just the trade on its own, there is probably better ways he could have handled this, or she. Definitely, definitely. He had some moments. It wasn't like it was straight up and off to the races. Uh, he had a moment there to take it off, a couple of moments, and he did not, or she. So again, this is something we talked about before. If it was indeed a hedge, and it looks like it was that way, you got to take him off when you get it. You get the opportunity. And obviously, this, this opportunity was kind of short-lived, so maybe he thought there was more coming. But still, uh, interesting stuff. He spent a lot compared to the relative value of the stock as well. If you're going to spend that much money for a hedge, I mean, the stock was 13 bucks. He spent $0.70 cents for a couple of weeks' worth of protection. If you're going to do that, you need a pretty quick move to the downside in order for that to work out. You got it. Maybe not exactly when you needed it, but you got it a little bit later. You got to take it when you get it. All right, moving on out here to our next name. We're going to dial the Wayback Machine back to February 13th now. On that episode, we talked about some puts in NetApp. This is ticker symbol NTAP. Again, I won't tell you where they're trading yet. That's a spoiler. But at the time, back on the show, we talked about the March 50 puts. About 8,000 of these bad boys went up. At the time, we talked about these being a pretty aggressive what looked like a line in the sand, they went up actually through the bid. They went up for 60, almost 61 cents, obviously on a little bit of uh, some ratios, a little bit of splits there. The bid was 65 cents at the time, so someone had to get a little aggressive to get 8,000 of these bad boys done. This was after earnings. The next cycle is going to be on May 20th, so there was no earnings in this time horizon. At the time, this print went up on February 13th. The stock was $55.18. Fast forward to today. Stock's at $39.16. I think you can see where this bad boy is going. And on expiration in March, stock closed at $36.24. And yes, listeners, once again, kind of a theme for our odd block of late. Uh, These puts were still open. All 8,000 and change of them were still open as of March expiration. So unfortunately, it seems like our friend here played a little bit too close to the fire, tried to harvest himself some premium and as a result, these puts went in his face to the tune of about $13.76 at expiration. So out in the ballpark of $11 million, and he pretty much lost about 13 bucks and change on these bad boys. So not exactly, not exactly the kind of use case we like to see. We've been seeing a lot of these of late, folks putting stuff on a little bit aggressive. Uh, this is where I think a lot of our aggressive put sellers are going to land of late, unless they were judicious and took them off when they had the opportunity. This guy didn't really have the opportunity. The stock 
pretty much, let's look back really quick. Stock pretty much never really. Well, actually, and I take that back. He had he had some moments here. It went up on the 13th, and then uh, the stock. Now the stock kind of got pretty aggressively clipped shortly thereafter. Within a couple of within like a week or so, the thing was trading uh, 46. So it was down about nine handles, and then so he was already through his strike from there. So he never really got an opportunity. It rallied a few times from there, but never north of 50 again. So. Our friend here pretty much got in at exactly the wrong time. Mr. Meatball, looks like our friend here got a bit of the old train runneth over, sir. Would you concur with these? Yeah, it appears to be so, and that's always a risk when, um, you know, when you, you do everything all at once. This is why, you know, when, um, you know, with everything that's been going on, with everything uh, that's been kind of tanking, I've been telling people, you know, don't do – everything at once don't just vomit out your trade do it over a, a period of time um but yeah no this was not uh was not a uh not the best of timing not the best of times for vomiting out your trade let's see if it's the best of times for uncle mike as we head on into the strategy block It's time to dispense options, wit, wisdom, and education. It's time for The Strategy Block. All right, everybody. It's Monday. It means it's time for a little bit of strategery. It's a good day for it. It's an Uncle Mike type of market. I have no idea what Uncle Mike has up his sleeve. I'm handing him a hot mic, or in this case, a hot old school telephone, (laughs) and letting him have at it. So Uncle Mike, sir... What do you got in store for us today, sir? The floor is yours. All right. So what I want to talk about today is something that I think is a very relevant strategy, but at this point in the game, uh, but I think it needs to be twofold. Uh, what I'm talking about is selling puts. And so we do still have a, rel- a high VIX, by, and by high, I mean comparison to three months ago, not comparison to a couple weeks ago, uh, with the VIX in the 40s, uh, compared to the VIX being in the 80s, which is a very low VIX, uh, but the VIX compared to being, uh, when you guys always talk about your magic, your crystal ball VIX for being, oh, I think it'll be 11, no, I think it'll be 14, no, I think it'll be 13, I mean, it's obviously very high compared to when we were in that world, to say the least. Uh, so... What I want to go through is some ways with which I think it would make sense to sell puts in this in this type of an environment, and uh, this is uh, these are some things that I am looking at or what I am doing actually for some of my more buy and hold clients as well as some of the uh, to some extent some uh, hedged trading uh, clients. So with that, step one, uh, you see a stock that you like or you see the index that you like, which is what I typically focus on. Is more of, I'm more of an index guy. But you sell an out-of-the-money put, meaning if XYZ stock is trading at 100, out-of-the-money means that the strike price is below the underlying when looking at puts. Uh, For calls, the strike price is above where the uh, price of the underlying is. But for puts, out-of-the-money means it is below where the price of the underlying is. So let's say that you're selling the put maybe 5%, 10% out-of-the-money, whatever the case may be. So when getting into the trade, the first two questions that you need to ask yourself are how far out of the money should you sell it and what time frame should you look at for selling it? So I personally, there's two schools of thought on where you can go to sell the put in terms of a time frame. For example, uh, some of the trades that, Mar- that Sebastian was talking about last week, and you can go out a year or so and sell, I'm not sure if it's even there anymore, but uh, what Mark was talking about is he was selling, I think it was 140 puts or something insane like that on SPY. And by doing that, you're getting a pretty good risk reward because of the fact that if the SPY were to go down roughly 50%, um, the thought would be, well, I'm fine buying at that level anyway. So what Mark was doing in his example is he is locking in the high volatility for the long term. Uh, so by doing that, let's say that volatility that the markets stay the same, but volatility goes way down, then he'll be able to get out of his put for a relatively low price if volatility were to return back to the uh, single digit or even the uh, below 15 for that matter. And so that's one school of thought. If you believe that volatility is very high right now and you think volatility is going to come lower, 
then you can do a trade like that. And by doing it, you're trying to take advantage of high implied volatility. Now, on the flip side, let's say that you believe that volatility is going to stay at these levels, meaning you think, you know what, even if we do rally, this coronavirus ain't going away anytime soon. And if that's the case, then I think I can make a lot of money in this doing uh, weekly options. Well, by doing that, if let's say the stock market were to stay the same and implied volatility were to stay the same and you sell an out of the money put maybe a little bit closer or I'll be a lot closer to where the price of the, of the underlying market is right now, then you're going to make more money than if you were to sell a longer term put option. If, and this is a big if, if volatility stays where it's at. So the reason with which you would sell a more longer term short put would be you want to lock in implied volatility or the, the high implied volatility. And if it goes away, then you're fine with that because you are locking it in at that anyway. Now, if you are selling a more short term put for purpose of implied volatility, then what you're doing is you're a, trying to take advantage of time decay, meaning, or more so of time decay, because of the fact that if you're doing a weekly, then the bottom line with any short option is that the, the, the premium that you sell is yours to keep forever and ever. However, the obligation that you took on is yours to keep until expiration. So by selling a more short-term option, and doing it over and over and over again, if vol stays at these levels, you will make more money doing it. However, if you sell a weekly option and then the next week vol goes away, uh, let's say we find a cure for the coronavirus, uh, well, then you're not going to make as much money if vol comes down much more quickly, or even if it comes down gradually over the course of the, the, the longer term, you're going to not make as much money because you're going to take in less and less premium every week. So that's kind of how you need to make your decision as to whether you should sell a more short-term option or a more long-term option. Now, should you sell something at the money? Should you sell something out of the money? Where should, or how far out of the money should you sell? Or should you even sell it in the money put? What should you do with this? Well, I believe that it depends on how aggressive you want to be with the underlying. So in other words, let's say that uh, you believe that the underlying is going to go up higher and you're pretty bullish on it. Well, then you should sell uh, an in-the-money short put or maybe own the underlying and sell an out-of-the-money call option, just whatever the synthetics work out best for your situation. Um, if you're neutral, then sell at the money. And if you are want to be more conservative, then you would sell a strike price out of the money, which is below the price of the underlying when selling short puts. Regardless of what you decide to sell, you need to be prepared to take ownership of the underlying. So let's say that XYZ stock is trading at $100 a share. You need to have $50 in your, I'm sorry, you need to have $100 in your account minus the premium that you take in. in order, And I'm using this in, a, in just a simplistic example. Of course, stocks need, you need to do this in 100 share increments and uh, you can't do a one lot on a uh, an option, it needs to be 100. Every option uh, controls 100 shares of stock. I'm just kind of oversimplifying this. But you need to have that amount in your account because that way, if you want to own the underlying, you need to be prepared to do so. Now, let's say that you're prepared to own the underlying on margin. Well, then you need to have $50 in your account. Granted, as soon as you own that underlying, you're going to be charged margin interest and you need to be prepared to pay that. But that is something with which you have the ability to do. Should you leverage yourself even more? And I would highly, highly, highly recommend that you not do this, but should you re re leverage yourself more, if you have roughly 10 to 15% of the underlying value in your account, and it's a margin account, you will be allowed to do it depending on what underlying it is. Some underlyings are allowed, they'll allow this, but in markets like this, margin departments can get a little bit more strict on such things. Or if you have a portfolio margin account, uh, you'll have the ability to get some pretty uh, loose margin requirements as well, or maintenance requirements as well. However, I would recommend against doing that just because of the fact that in a market like this, if things go against you, it's not going to be pretty. If you want to leverage yourself and do some leverage trading, 
buy call spreads. Don't over leverage yourself selling naked puts. That's my opinion now, always and forever for that matter. So that is the strategy block on selling puts for today, April 6th. Mr. Meatball, really quickly, he mentioned kind of short-term puts versus longer-term puts. You were talking last week on the show about doing your, your Buffett put plays and Spy and a few others. I'm curious, have you, have you done anything in those puts since then, or do you, you still have them on out there, sir? In Spy? Um, so I closed out my April and have been rolling back to – um may and june uh in some clients we've been trading berkshire hathaway uh out of the money puts in june 2022 uh we've been doing some in you know coca-cola uh i did a uh some some leap puts i did some bearish things that are uh longer term on a ratio in uh aforementioned gamestop which unfortunately i think is going to go the way of the dinosaur. And, um, and, and so, yeah, I think that with Vic still in the forties, longer dated vol, which tends to move a little slower, uh, is going to be at, at that sweet spot for setting up trades right now, which is why I've moved a lot of my duration from April and, and even May out to June and July, because that there's just, it's hard not to want to be short uh, Vega right now because it's it's relatively inexpensive, uh, to, or it's relatively expensive uh, if you think that uh, you know Vol's gonna. If you think that we're at a point where where we've kind of figured out what we don't know, right? They're, they're, we're at a new level of unknowns, right? We know what we don't know. We don't know. We have a lot fewer unknown unknowns, which means Vol is is tapping out um you know i i would argue that people wearing face masks to the store is actually going to is something that should dampen volatility um and so as you see everybody if, if you go to a jewel and or a jewel like everyone knows who jewel is if you go to a kroger uh and um you see 80 percent of the people there wearing masks well that's a sign that volatility is probably peaked and uh, I can tell you that at the store, a lot of people are wearing masks. That is indeed the case. As we head on into our final segment, it is time to go around the block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, before we get into Around the Block, really quickly, let's look back a little bit, see what you guys thought for last week, we asked you guys, you know, S&P had just blown through a week ago, had just blown through 2,600 to the upside. And, of course, listeners, guess where we are yet again, right back north of that 2,600 level at about 2,635 or so, threatening to be up 6% on the day. Oh, how the worm has turned or perhaps in this case stayed the same over the course of the past week. But we asked you, what are you feeling a month from last week? So now three weeks from now. Uh, what are you feeling? Is this a rally for real? Is this a bit of a dead cat bounce? Something else maybe? And almost 70% of you, 67.3% said, yeah, you were fading this, you think, a month from last week. So three weeks from now, we will be lower. This is the dead cat bounce. About 14% thought you'd be right around this 2600 level, which at least a week later, looking to be the prescient pick out there. Uh, 12.8% of you saying, you think you'll be higher? The rally is real, so... A small sliver of our audience were buying what this rally was selling, thinking this had some legs to it. A lot of you still thinking the worst days were to come. And nearly 6% of you, 5.8% of you saying, yeah, we don't care. We're in cash. We're waiting for saner heads to perhaps prevail out there. All right, let's head back around the horn, see what each of our cohorts is watching here for the rest of the week until at least we can gather here together on this program again. On Thursday, let's start with the grease. Just a meatball, Mr. Meatball. You just talked about what you're doing in your puts. What are you watching? What are you guys up to in your ball trading club for the coming weeks, sir? Yeah, you know, um, I see a lot of. Uh, you know, we'll get into this hopefully on Friday in Volviews, but I see the, a, a real scenario where we could be flat to down on the week in the S and P, and Vol could be in as well. Uh, I think there is um, everything I'm seeing says that we're uh, in kind of that a 
a uh, kind of the December t- 2008 to March 2009 territory. Um, you know, this this feels like a more severe, uh, much shorter version of the price action that we saw in 2008, 2009. So by that case, uh, I think that we're in that uh, kind of January time frame of uh, the as the stock market in uh, January 2009. I should note your cohort there, Mr. Mr. Rock Lobster, tweeting once again about Vol Man, <laughs> our favorite volatility stick figure. If you want to see what he's uh, chatting about, listeners, give him a follow on the Twitters at Option Vol Vol Man. Very cleverly, craftily drawn, with a lot, a lot of heart, a lot of skill behind drawn Vol Man. I encourage you. Uh, to check him out. It's an impressive character. All right. And speaking of impressive characters, Uncle Mike, sir, what are you watching for the rest of this week until we can gather here together on Thursday? Well, I, I think that, uh, like I said, today's close is pretty important. I think the 2700 mark or the 270 mark on SPY, like I was saying earlier, uh, on the S&P, I think is pretty important because that's uh, a level we could not break through, or that was kind of like our high when uh, the president declared a national state of emergency. So I think that's definitely the main thing I'm watching. Of course, I'm watching all the news and things along those lines. Uh, But uh, that's uh, where I'm looking at right now. All right, listeners, unfortunately, that music means we've come to the end of an epic journey through the world of options. But don't worry if you're saying to yourself, I need a little more. Got more for you. Coming up in a little bit, I'll be talking with the folks over there at Trade Station. They got a pretty big crypto offering going on out there. They'll be joining me on the crypto rundown, talk about all the volatility, the skew, the open interest, the volume, all the stuff that's going on in the world of crypto derivatives, puts, calls, futures, you name it, all that good stuff. Talk some spot as well. Answer a whole bunch of your questions because I'm sure you got them. So we'll be doing that in about exactly an hour. In the meantime, if you're listening live, we'll pump some fun stuff into uh, the live stream, and we'll be back again to do that. Of course, you listen after the fact, like most of you are. Hit next on that player of yours. You can get right into that one without having to wait. But before we go, let's not wait any longer to see what they have cooking. That may interest you. Let's start Let's start with the greasiest of meatballs. Mr. Meatball, sir, if I'm intrigued by such things as the Ball Trading Club, maybe I want to write my own Buffett puts. Uh, where should I go? What should I do, sir? Yeah, make sure you're on our mail list. Go to optionpit.com. Get in. Uh, make sure you're on our mailing list so that you can get the blogs that I'm putting out. Um, a couple weeks ago, we launched our new newsletter, uh, the Vic, the Vix Spikes Edge, uh, and that is uh, something that if you want to know about volatility and trading, then you need to be registered for. And, uh, and so head right there and, and give us your name and email and we'll get you all kinds of amazing information. There you go. The VIX Spikes Edge. <laughs> I like the name there. Optionpit.com is a place to learn more. Maybe, maybe you want to join a ball trading club, get a sweet MAGA hat, kick on out, make yourself, uh, make yourself available. All that fun stuff. Optionpit.com is the place to go. Maybe you want to make yourself available and open to a new financial advisor in your life. I get it. It's a big relationship. It's a big commitment. Maybe you want to find out what's going on over there first. Kick the tires. Mr. Uncle Mike, if they are so intrigued, perhaps they're in the market for a new financial advisor relationship. Where should they go? What should they do? Uh, Step one, you can go to my website at stcharleswealth.com if you'd like to sign up for an appointment to talk things over with me with what's going on with these crazy markets right now and uh, how it affects your portfolio. Uh, There's a spot on my website to do that. Uh, also, uh, feel free to just call me directly. Um, I'm, I, I'm just sitting in my house right now looking at markets, so I can't leave the house. But uh, give me a call, 630-885-0017. Uh, feel free to contact me at any time. I'd love to talk with you. There you go. He's sitting in his house just watching the markets. Maybe you have him do that for you, too. StCharlesWealth.com is the place to go to begin your journey. And on behalf of the greasiest of meatballs and Uncle Mike, and indeed myself. I thank all of you out there for downloading, for streaming, for subscribing, for listening live, for sending in those questions. We'll get to more of those on the next show. Don't you worry. We'll be back in a little bit, about an hour, talk some crypto. We'll be back uh, tomorrow, all sorts, throughout the rest of the week, with all sorts of fun programming in store for you, including OPR and a bunch of other fun stuff. We'll be back, of course, on Thursday for more of TWIFO and indeed of this fine program, The Option Block. 
So we'll see you then. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>